for any incident from the Las Vegas massacre to the Boston bombings. Citizens play an important role in saving lives in the minutes following an attack. It is imperative that we provide the knowledge and skills necessary to help our community save lives until our professional responders can arrive. This video is a prerequisite to the in-person class where you will learn how to recognize violent activities, respond safely, provide immediate rescue tactics to those affected by traumatic injuries, and report to 911 efficiently. The skills you will learn are transferable to countless situations, including car accidents, household injuries, or an active shooter attack. Please watch this entire video prior to attending the in-person training. This program was designed and developed by the Arlington County Department of Public Safety, Communications, and Emergency Management and the Arlington County Fire Department. The overall goal of this course is to make Arlington County safer by better preparing our community to be the help until help arrives. This video will introduce you to the need for development of and the overview of civilian high threat medical principles to be applied during mass casualty events. It will provide a foundational understanding of the medical treatments of tactical emergency casualty care that will be built upon in the additional hands-on training. This is a warning. There are graphic photos that depict the injured and dead from mass casualty events in the upcoming slides. These pictures are not intended to have shock value or to be upsetting. Instead, these medical pictures are used to illustrate educational points, as well as to convey the seriousness of injuries for which we must be prepared to treat. Out of respect for the wounded and deceased, anonymity is maintained in each picture to protect privacy. So, are we paying attention yet? Attacks are occurring on soft targets, schools and children, mass gatherings and mass transit, pre-hospital and hospital personnel, public places and commerce, and military personnel and facilities. This threat is not going away anytime soon. It is time to make a change in how we think and react to these events. Change starts now with this course. By training to be the help until help arrives, it will empower you to implement the tactical emergency casualty care principles throughout our community, and together we can begin to improve survival. The 2013 bombings at the Boston Marathon changed the game for medical response. Although it had been discussed and to a certain extent experienced, the explosions at the finish line in Boston represented a visual and tangible introduction to both the pre-hospital and hospital medical community about the unique nature of injuries caused by military-style ordinances. Boston has helped move the needle and change our focus in these mass casualty events away from our traditional approach to trauma, as previously taught in courses like Civilian First Aid. The Boston bombings, along with other horrific mass casualty events that preceded it, demonstrated the absolute severity of the wounded, as well as the differences in high velocity and high energy blast trauma from what we are accustomed to seeing. The 2012 shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut was a cultural game changer. The absolute horror of the event and the nationwide visceral reaction to the slaughter of innocent children and adults has helped to bring the issue of mass casualty events and the need for a paradigm change in our tactical and operational medical response to the forefront of the national consciousness. The truth is that none of the 20 children or six adults could have survived their injuries, even with rapid point of wounding care. However, the aftermath of Newtown has given momentum to the fact that by creating a comprehensive medical response system, they can quickly address the preventable causes of death. So how can we improve survival for the injured in the immediate aftermath of these events? First, we must fully understand exactly what we are facing and how the tactics, techniques, and procedures being used in the attack impact the delivery of medical care to the wounded. In 2018, we need to understand that our priorities for preparedness must be reordered. In the past, emergency preparedness focused on what can be called traditional weapons of mass destruction. Nerve agents like sarin, radiological dirty bombs, improvised nuclear devices, anthrax, and smallpox. 
Although we cannot ignore these threats, we have to understand the actual likelihood of their use, and thus where in the priority list for preparation these traditional threats lie. Without losing our institutional knowledge and preparedness for these traditional threats, we must now understand that the threat environment has shifted in the radical ideology of our enemies towards readily available and easily utilized weapons. This is our new threat environment. This is what we need to be prepared for. The new aspects of our threat environment have significant impacts on the delivery of medical care. There are several restrictions to medical care. Supplies and equipment will be limited only to what is immediately available or initially brought to the scene. There will be limited manpower in the operational area, and there will be a potential for prolonged and horizontal evacuation. In our new threat environment, the casualty profile is shifted towards traumatic injury. Expect multiple patients, each with multiple wounds, from high-velocity ballistics, IED explosives with extensive fragmentation, and amputations. All things we saw in Boston, Orlando, and Vegas. The typical trauma patient is a healthy 14 to 45 year old male. However, in our new threat environment, we are increasingly seeing patient populations that are more reflective of general society, which includes the very young and the very old, the infirm and those with a wide variety of underlying medical problems. During high risk and complex attacks, there will be a delay in getting medical care to the wounded. The final impact on medical care is that in this high threat environment, medical decision making must be based on a risk benefit assessment. The medical first responder must maintain enhanced situational awareness while simultaneously providing appropriate and effective patient care. In our new threat environment, we have to change our approach. Step two to improving survival is to understand the medical evidence that exists from past mass casualty events. By necessity, you will need to understand some basic anatomy and physiology to grasp these concepts, so consider this next section to be a mini medical school. Through the extensive research and reporting in the military medical community, we have now a deeper understanding of the physiological effect of military-grade weapons. Through retrospective review of medical records and post-combat autopsies, certain causes of death have been identified that can be deemed potentially preventable. A preventable cause of death is an injury that can be quickly and easily managed with minimal equipment by a minimally trained rescuer, but, if left untreated, can lead to death. Here are a few well-known preventable causes of death. The first cause of preventable death and one that is relatively simple to treat, is bleeding to death from an extremity wound or amputation. No one should ever bleed to death from an extremity wound, no matter how severe the injury. External bleeding, meaning bleeding that is outside of the body as opposed to inside the chest or abdomen, is easy to recognize and easy to treat. However, it is helpful to have some basic understanding of the circulatory system and how we bleed. The human circulatory system is comprised of the heart and all of the circulatory vessels into two integrated systems. The right side of the heart collects deoxygenated blood from the body and pumps that blood to the lungs where it can be oxygenated. The left side of the heart collects oxygenated blood from the lungs and pumps it back into the body. Essentially, arteries are high pressure vessels that carry blood, typically oxygenated and thus bright red, away from the heart and veins are low pressure vessels that carry blood, typically deoxygenated and thus dark red, back to the heart. All of the large arteries and veins in the body can create significant life-threatening bleeding when damaged, but during high threat medical care, only the ones that lead to external bleeding, especially from the extremities, are a focus. The arteries and veins that bleed significantly and can easily be controlled with proper technique include the carotid artery and jugular vein in the neck, the femoral artery and vein in the upper groin and leg, the brachial artery in the vein and the inner arm, and the radial artery in the vein and the wrist. If bleeding is massive and life-threatening, every second and every drop of blood counts towards survival. Massive bleeding must be addressed immediately, starting with the basic application of a direct pressure over the wound, followed by several different options for definitive bleeding control that will be discussed during the hands-on portion of this program. Lay persons are often concerned about their 
ability to discern life-threatening from non-life-threatening bleeding. A simple but effective rule to help you make a quick decision is what we like to refer to as, wow, that's a lot of blood rule. If you look at a wound and your first impulse is shock at the amount of blood either already lost or flowing from the wound, then it is a safe bet that the wound is significant and should be immediately addressed. During military combat, we see that the majority of fatal combat injuries die within the first 30 minutes, and many of these deaths are due to bleeding. Every minute with uncontrolled life-threatening traumatic injury decreases your chance of survival. On the left is a picture of five liters of blood. That's roughly an average adult's entire blood volume. On the right is half of that blood, or 2.5 liters. If you lose 2.5 liters of blood through a massive bleed, it's likely you will go into a state of irreversible shock. It doesn't matter if we resuscitate you at this point. Your blood loss has initiated an irreversible biochemical process that will lead to death. Essentially, the longer you lay there and bleed, the more likely you are going to die. We don't have too many hard and fast rules in medicine, but one of the hard and fast rules is that all bleeding stops eventually. Every minute with uncontrolled injury decreases your chance of survival. Ideally, we get to you and stop the bleeding before it stops on its own. Time counts after traumatic injury. This common sense conclusion has been long supporting the basic tenets of combat care. Research from the 1970s indicates that the greatest benefit will be achieved through a configuration that puts a caregiver at the patient's side within a few seconds of the wounding. Essentially, the wounded cannot wait for treatment. They have uncontrolled wounds and they will continue to die while waiting for evacuation. Instead, to improve survival, the wounded must be treated as quickly and as close as possible at the point of wounding. For this reason, far forward placement of medical assets and medically trained individuals is life-saving. The second cause of preventable death is due to respiratory and circulatory compromise from wounds to the chest and lungs. Chest injuries were found to be the most likely cause of preventable death in one study of active shooting incidents. Called a pneumothorax, pneumo meaning air and thorax meaning chest, the penetrating chest injury can easily be understood as a hole in the chest wall or lung that leads to air building up outside the lung itself, but still inside the chest. In an open pneumothorax, respirations are compromised due to a large hole in the chest, as seen here. A tension pneumothorax is due to a leak of air from the injured lung into the chest cavity. As air leaks into the chest, it can become trapped, and the resulting buildup in pressure inside the chest impedes the circulation of blood through the heart. Both of these conditions will be discussed again in greater detail later in the program. Understanding the physiology of how we breathe makes the concept of a pneumothorax and how it is treated more understandable. The function of the respiratory system is dependent on the integrity of all of its parts. At its most basic, the act of breathing is due to pressure differentials created inside the chest. Any damage changes the physics involved, and the process of breathing loses effectiveness. To understand this concept, think of the chest wall, clavicles, and diaphragm enclosed in a box around the lungs. During inspiration, the muscles in the chest wall actively contract, pulling the rib cage up and out. The diaphragm also contracts, moving downward. These two actions increase the volume inside of the box, which then acts to decrease the pressure. As the pressure drops, air is pulled through the mouth and trachea into the lungs where oxygen can exchange with blood. Expiration is a passive process. As the contracted muscles relax, the elastic chest wall springs back and the diaphragm returns to its original position, decreasing the volume inside the chest box. This decrease in volume causes an increase in the pressure inside the box, pushing air out of the lungs, through the trachea, and out of the mouth. So the process of breathing occurs through pressure differentials created inside of the chest, and the system requires all of its components to be in good working order. Damage to any component of the respiratory system compromises the ability to breathe and exchange oxygen. For example, a hole in the chest wall creates another opening for air to move in and out of the chest box. If the hole is big enough, air will move in and out of that hole instead of through the mouth and trachea into the lungs. 
This will cause the lung to collapse, will stop the process of oxygenation, and may lead to a deadly buildup of air pressure inside the chest. Although treatment of respiratory injury can be very complex, simply covering the chest wound with a one-way vented dressing that prevents the movement of air into the chest through the wound but allows air out of the chest will restore the integrity of the chest wall and will allow effective pressure differentials to occur. Respiratory mechanics will be restored and oxygen exchange will improve. This is not a definitive treatment for the injury, but most certainly you will buy time for the patient to get to a higher level of care. Another frequent cause of preventable death is injury to the airway or an injury that directly impacts the airway, such as this one. This patient has a fragmentation injury that cut one of the arteries in the face, causing bleeding into the mouth. If he was unconscious and laying on his back, the position we long have been taught as the preferred position for an injured person, all of the blood would drain into his mouth and he would eventually die. An injury such as this is easy to stabilize by simply putting the patient onto his side so that blood drains from the mouth. If you are unconscious and you lay on your back, the tongue falls backward and blocks the airway. Just as in the previous slide, this is easily treated by proper positioning of the patient. This is a picture of the rescue position and how any unconscious person should be positioned. When laying in this position, the tongue falls forward and any fluid, blood, or vomit in the airway will drain out instead of going backwards and choking the patient. Another frequent cause of preventable death is hypothermia. Only recently have we begun to understand the importance of preventing hypothermia in an injured patient. Medical personnel have long been taught to cut off all the clothes to expose the patient and search for wounds as a standard of care. The problem with that approach is that by cutting off or removing clothes, we are disrupting the thermal barrier that clothes provide and the patient will start to get cold. We know that in the trauma patient, even a small decrease in internal body temperature will interfere with clotting. If you don't clot, you continue to bleed and you continue to die. In fact, data shows that there is almost 100% death rate in trauma patients whose core body temperature falls below 90 degrees. A patient who is in traumatic shock cannot generate enough internal body heat to stay warm. Not to mention, once the patient gets cold, it is hard to reverse. Instead, you must be aware of and aggressively work to prevent the development of hypothermia. Step three in improving survival is identifying the gap that exists in traditional mass casualty medical response. In our current response paradigm, who has the responsibility to mitigate the medical effects of a mass casualty event? The answer is fire and EMS, pre-hospital medical providers. The brave men and women who show up, assess, and begin treatment for any medical problem that a citizen may call 911 for. 99% of the time, the structure and response is fine. But in our new threat environment, when there is an ongoing threat to both patients and providers, does this model still work? The problem is that the standard model of medical response relies on several assumptions. Number one, our current model of pre-hospital medical care assumes that the medical responders will be immediately available and at the side of the patient within the recommended four minutes for a basic call and eight minutes for an advanced call. Although this system works and Arlington Fire and EMS is at the patient's side in a few short minutes for a heart attack, stroke, or even car accidents, in these high threat shootings and attacks, there is an inherent delay in getting to the side of the patient due to the ongoing threat, the law enforcement operations, and the need for coordination among public safety responders. If we only rely on the public safety first responders to assist the injured in our new threat environment, there will be a delay in stabilizing the wounded and stopping the dying process. The wounded continue to die as they lay on the floor of the classroom, office, or hallway, while outside, the public safety first responders are organizing and working together for a combined operational response. This reliance on public first responders alone also increases the individual and collective community psychological damage. Citizens that are not empowered to be part of the solution inevitably feel helpless. 
as they barricade in a room with an injured or dying person waiting for rescue, if they are solely reliant on public safety and not trained to assist the dying in even a minimal way, the psychological damage will be significant and enduring. Here is the truth about complex mass casualty incidents. Uninjured or minimally injured citizens are there in the immediate aftermath of an attack. Police, fire, and EMS responders are not. Often, there are not enough public safety responders to provide immediate care to all of the wounded. Regular citizens are available and willing to assist, yet are traditionally marginalized by public safety and emergency preparedness efforts. Past events have shown us that citizens will act in the immediate aftermath and will save lives. You are the foundation to improving survival. If we do not engage you as a community, if you are untrained, if we don't trust and empower you to act, many of the victims with potential injuries will be far along in the dying process by the time our fire and EMS first responders get to their side. Now that we have identified the gaps, the fourth step is to develop new strategies to mitigate the known gaps during high threat medical rescue operations. The goal, as stated by the National Institutes of Health in 2016, is zero preventable deaths after injury. Like the military system in place for combat medical operations, we must build and empower a system of medical response that accounts for all wounding. The medical guidelines you will be taught during the hands-on portion of this program is a civilian-specific medical response framework called Tactical Emergency Casualty Care or TECC. TECC is civilian developed and includes best practices from military combat medicine, but is translated and adapted to civilian data, language, protocols, population, and operational constraints. The primary goal of TECC is to identify those with potentially preventable causes of death and prioritize rapid application of stabilizing medical care at or near the point of wounding during a mass casualty incident. TECC is a system of care that addresses only the potentially preventable deaths with rapid point of wounding stabilization. It is not a complete medical system of care for all wounds that can occur and for all causes of death in these events. TECC is a set of civilian driven, civilian appropriate, vetted and evolving principles of care. TECC is a risk benefit based set of guidelines it allows for real-time risk-benefit analysis and for adjustment of the medical treatment priorities based on that provider's assessment of risk. TECC is evidence and consensus best practice based. History and research have shown us that everybody has a role in improving survivability in mass casualty events. We must move away from the traditional paradigm of reliance on professional medical first responders to handle all of the injuries. TECC is most effective when implemented as a system across the community, being applied by all involved but must be scoped appropriately to each level of provider. To improve survival, TECC must be trained and implemented across the entire chain. From the citizen first care providers, to law enforcement, to the fire EMS personnel, to the non-trauma hospital emergency departments, and the full trauma centers. Each link in the chain serves to support the next, allowing the patient to be stabilized at the point of wounding with good TECC care that is built upon and continued. Over the past six years, we have been teaching and training our Arlington County police officers in TECC. To date, we have had a number of Arlington officers apply TECC care principles to wounded citizens as well as other officers with great success. All Arlington County Police Patrol vehicles also carry TECC kits mounted to the headrests. This is a photo of the aftermath of a gang fight. The injured person on the ground was stabbed in the upper arm, causing an injury to the brachial artery. One of the TECC trained police officers on the scene quickly recognized the severity of the bleeding, applied direct pressure to slow the bleed, and a military emergency tourniquet above the wound. With the bleeding fully controlled by the tourniquet, he then applied a pressure dressing directly to the wound. This allowed the fire and EMS responders to downgrade the tourniquet almost immediately upon their arrival. This is TECC in action. 
We have also trained and empowered our Arlington County Fire and EMS in TECC. Since 2011, we have led the region in training all personnel and equipping all fire vehicles with TECC equipment for rapid response. Improving survival for fire and EMS providers involves first getting to the side of the wounded. We cannot help anyone we cannot get to. This is where the integrated operations concept of warm zone care comes into play. In 2008, Arlington County developed a model of response to active violent events, which fire EMS personnel rapidly integrate into rescue teams with police officers. Often referred to as Rescue Task Force, it is essentially accomplished by the first arriving fire personnel teaming up with the first arriving patrol officers to move quickly into warm zone areas and initiate TECC and evacuation of victims. Over the past five years, the Rescue Task Force model has been adopted and promoted across the United States as the recommended approach to respond to these events. Arlington County Fire and Police train monthly on this model to keep our response and skills current. In Arlington, our goal is to initiate rescue within five to 10 minutes of arriving on scene. However, even in a perfect world where we can meet that goal and begin rescue operations, there will still be a delay in getting to the injured. Over the past few years, Arlington has also led the way in getting all of the area hospitals, both trauma and non-trauma centers, familiar with the tenants of TECC, and how hospitals can act in collaboration with fire and EMS medical providers to maintain continuity of care. Finally, to complete the TECC chain of survival in Arlington, this program was established to educate our community on how they can be the help until help arrives. Empowering citizens is not new to our community. Programs like CPR, Hurricane Arlington, Run, Hide, Fight, and Active Shooter Drills have long been part of our community fabric. In the aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombing, first care providers jumped into action to save lives. In this picture, the wounded man with devastating bilateral amputations is being kept alive by the citizen in the cowboy hat and a Boston public safety first responder. These first two links in the TECC chain of survival are working together to evacuate the patient to a higher level of care. The hands-on training that accompanies this video will teach you mental strategies to help prepare for the stress you will be under and to improve your mental and psychological response during the event. Basic TECC starting with bleeding control but including simple airway management, body positioning, and hypothermia prevention. How to efficiently and effectively move a patient. And we must empower and emphasize the absolute importance of providing psychological support to the wounded to calm them, to tell them that all will be okay, and to help the wounded find a reason to fight and live. So the new message for our community is to be the help until help arrives. You are one of the keys to improving survival after mass casualty incidents. With this training and subsequent hands-on session, you can be the help until police and fire EMS responders arrive. You can save lives in the immediate aftermath by quickly and efficiently addressing any of the preventable causes of death through tactical emergency casualty care. Thank you for listening to this program. To register for the hands-on portion of this training, please visit readyarlington.com or if you are an Arlington County employee, please visit the Learning Center on AC Commons.